everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Dell Technology Services Virtual Headquarters in our session today with our Microsoft Platinum sponsor. Today, we're going to be speaking with you about executing your Microsoft-based workforce transformation strategy, leveraging Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. We have Sandy Walker, who's our global partner lead for Microsoft Teams from Microsoft, and Matt Roberts, global consulting lead, workforce transformation here in Dell Technology Services. At this time, I'll turn it over to Matt and Sandy. Thanks so much, Julie, and, and welcome everybody. Um, as Julie said, I'm Matt Roberts, and, and you know today we're gonna focus a bit on our best practices around optimizing and personalizing, as well as securing your Microsoft 365 platform. I mean, ultimately we wanna help you achieve the productivity and collaboration benefits of your investment. So let's get started. Uh, as Julie said, this is uh, my, myself, Matt Roberts from the Dell Technology Services team. And I am thrilled and honored to be joined today by our guest speaker, Mr. Sandy Walker. Sandy, say hi. Hi everyone, and uh, Matt, always a pleasure. Great working with you guys. So. <laughs> Cheers. All right, so Sandy, thanks for being here. Looking forward to the discussion. Let's keep going. So the agenda today, you can see, spans the gamut of advice and guidance uh, across the whole of Microsoft 365. Um, we're going to give you some you know, tidbits and recommendations on some technical aspects, certainly some guidance on how to approach Microsoft 365 and think about each of the workloads uh, from an end user standpoint. Um, we're certainly going to talk about some employee experience topics uh, as part of our session today. Ultimately, our goal is to help you understand what good looks like based upon our experience in helping customers implement the platform and drive value out of it. All right, so just a quick uh, reminder that everything we're talking about today are is something that Dell Technology Services can help you with. Um, and before we jump into the main substance of the session, I'd like to give you just a high level overview of Dell Services. Uh, this slide that you see here is essentially a snapshot of our services portfolio. And without going into detail on each capability, we just want you to know that our services span the full range of customer needs from advisory consulting capabilities, system integration services, and an expansive range of deployment, support, managed, and education services. Microsoft, th Microsoft 365 is a core focus for all of the teams represented here on this slide, and we stand ready and willing to, to assist you on your journey. All right. So Sandy, let's talk about creating a modern foundation with Windows 10. And you know, I think in particular, we see that a lot of customers in the past couple of years upgraded from Windows 7 to Windows 10, and they incorporated those new builds into their PC ref refresh policies and processes. They, they started deploying new PCs and devices with, with Windows 10 on it. But many of those same customers are still using traditional imaging and app deployment approaches. And essentially, they haven't yet embraced modern provisioning and modern management. So yep. Sandy, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here. Could you provide some perspectives on how customers can start their journey to a modern foundation for Windows 10? Absolutely. So thanks, Matt. Um, and yes, yeah, so if we take a step back, um, you know, when we think about modern provisioning, we need to remind ourselves of actually where we've come from. So as you said there, many people haven't optimized that position yet where they're in. You know, historically, we would design a PC image you know, for, a, for the employees or maybe a different employee with an end-to-end -end view of what we wanted and then build that image. Once we build that image, then we had to you know, deploy that image over every single device. And usually that was in a pretty manual way. Um, and then we'd have to repeat that set process if we had to do something in life, maybe for an update or if there was you know, an issue in life. Obviously, stating the obvious, that's a very expensive way of doing it from a time perspective. It was very reliant on IT, actually knowing what they wanted, knowing what they could achieve. Um, and it might have happened at non-optimal times, particularly for large organizations or global organizations, you know, and or if they needed to do you know, an emergency patch, you know, you need to throw things, they needed to just throw things out there and it might have other impacts, like a huge load on the on the network, for example. Many people are still doing this. Um, 
And there, there is no blocker for that. So you can carry on. But what we've been looking at and trying to achieve is actually how, you know, with over a billion uh, Windows 10 devices out there in the market, of actually what can we do as Microsoft to support that and drive a more uh, you know, effective and efficient kind of a, and more secure way of doing it. So we're trying to think about things in a new way. And that's pretty much as we see here, you know, we want to keep things really simple. Take it out of the box, switch it on, log in, and you're ready to go. Ready, ready for, uh, ready for, ready for action, ready for productive use. So, what does that actually mean? So, when we look at this, and if we unpack this a little bit further, um, and when we think about things like Windows Autopilot, um, and that's you know, kind of the Windows Autopilot is pretty much a collection of technologies used to set up and configure devices. You want to get them ready for productive use. Um, and you can also use Windows Pilot to, you know, reset or repurpose and recover devices as well. Um, and so this type of solution enables your IT department to achieve device management with little or no infrastructure to manage, you know, with a very simple process. You know, it allows, you know, IT provision your, you know, your corporate, your organization's, you know, policies, settings and or apps, you know, like Microsoft 365, you know, Pro Plus. You know, by connecting it to Azure Active Directory and Microsoft Intune, and then simplify that whole management process and that it had that whole management experience. Um, and so once you do that, um, you know, you can see the devices, you can see the devices enrolled, you can get an inventory uh, of what they are and, you know, kind of what um, and what people are accessing from an organizational resource perspective as well. And then you can configure those meeting, configure those devices to meet your security and health standards. For example, you might want to block jailbroken devices. You could do that. Um, or you might need to push a new certificate out to users. Maybe there's a new Wi-Fi network in a location um, or need to you know, push out a new VPN. You can do all this kind of in a lot more um, kind of highly automated way, whilst then also then reporting on the devices that are compliant or non-compliant by your, by your corporate standards. Um, and obviously, very you know, importantly these days um, is well, actually maybe less important with the amount of work from home. But if, if people are losing devices or getting devices stolen, then you're able to you know kind of remove that device from the organisation and you know and to kind of to make sure it's not used anymore and so your data is more safe. So fundamentally, processes like this are great for the organisation. Simplified experience, improved management, performance, stability, all those good fun words. Um, you know, it's a quicker deployment, more efficient deployment, and a lot lower kind of load on other aspects. Maybe, you know, as I mentioned earlier, on the network. Um, and but importantly, I, you know, and today we'll talk about kind of the end user. It's really great from an end user's perspective. You know, so the end user has got a, a, an easy process, a very slick process, um, and you know, less downtime for them. Um, you know, and they can choose when they do this. So apart from setting up, if they do, if we are doing an update. You can defer that update if you're in the middle of a big presentation. So right now, for example, I'm presenting uh, with Matt to you guys. And if Microsoft asks me to do an update or patch, I can defer it. It's not going to shut my machine down. I can go, right, I'll do that later. I'll do it tomorrow. So there's a bit of self-control as well, within reason. You, you, know, you still need to get let the user kind of ultimately kind of um, have to, the, the end user will ultimately have to do the updates anyway. And whilst we do that, that means you can have access um, to the, the latest and greatest features for productivity and creativity. So it's just a nice slick, simple process um, but you know alongside that and it's not only the process behind it but it's also you know actually what are we using what are we shipping so you know Matt maybe kind of what does a modern device mean then as well not only a modern provision but process device as well yeah no thanks Andy I, I mean certainly here at Dell we uh, we have a large variety of client devices peripherals monitors conferencing room equipment you know pretty much our goal is to have the right products and solutions to meet the needs of the workforce. And, you know, we certainly think that Microsoft 365 demands a modern device, whether it's a touchscreen or, you know, convertible type of format, or whether it's those large monitors that let you see everything, you know, everything possible within uh, your collaboration and productivity space. Um, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is, is provide different types of devices and experiences for different personas and work styles to meet people where they're at and, and help them be as productive as they can be. Um, so whether you're, you know, that, that knowledge worker and, you know, working remotely and you need a multiple monitor set up and a team certified speakerphone and headset and, you know, quality webcam, or whether you're a first line worker that just needs a rugged device running Microsoft 365, Dell does have solutions and answers for all that. 
All right, so that's the modern foundation for Microsoft 365. And, and you know, we certainly seem to agree here, Sandy, that everyone needs to move towards those modern management techniques within Windows 10, but also, you know, frankly, look at their, their devices and peripherals as well to make sure people are getting the most out of the experience. Let's talk more about the apps and experiences of M365 itself uh, as a next step, because I know a lot of our customers um, are beginning this journey and some of them are, are way down the road. Um, so one of the things that, that we talk about here at Dell a lot is that Microsoft 365 is an ever evolving uh, platform with dozens of apps at this point, you know, dozens of different experiences. Um, and a lot of our customers, especially our IT customers, tend to, to kind of stop once they've got the major workloads deployed, whether that's getting mail to the cloud or the Microsoft 365 apps deployed on their devices, or maybe they're, they've moved their SharePoint real estate um, into SharePoint Online and, and gotten OneDrive engaged, and they've started to use Teams. You know, these are great foundational workloads that yes, we think every customer needs to deploy and implement and migrate to, and even within them, there's a level of maturity to get you to fully harnessing what those, those you know, workloads and applications provide. But as you know, we show on the screen here, there's so much more to Microsoft 365 and, and, you know, frankly, you know, continues to be, there continue to be new announcements all the time of, of additional purpose built experiences, you know, custom templates and applications that Microsoft is making available. And essentially our message is your journey is not ever over. There's always something to, to do here. There's always something that your business could be taking advantage of to make them more productive, to streamline their business process. Uh, or just to deliver a better experience. And so, you know, here at Dell, a lot of the services that we offer are, you know, aimed at helping you not just look at the major workloads, but really look at it uh, in totality to make sure that you're going to get the most value uh, that you can for your investment. So to that end, you know, we have some things that we recommend to our customers in terms of, you know, how they approach deploying this suite of capabilities. For those, for those of you who or at the beginning of your journey, you might need help just figuring out an overall you know, strategy and plan. And those of you that are well down the road and have those major workloads rolled out, it may be more about how do I get people to adopt it and how do I measure what they're using so that we can adjust and, and enhance their experience accordingly. Or you may be somewhere in the middle. You may have done some of the, the major workloads, but you still got a few left to do. Ultimately, we know that most of you listening today already know what Microsoft 365 is, and, and you probably have some semblance of what your, your plan's going to be, but we have services here to help you, whether you're at the beginning of that journey or all the way at the end. And ultimately, our, we ask one question of all of you. Where are you on your Microsoft 365 journey? What are you trying to do next? Ultimately, then, we can be prescriptive on, on showing you what good looks like in terms of approach or outcome. Uh, we can be your fast track delivery partner, as an example but we can also be flexible and modular just to just plug in some expertise where you feel like you most need it. All right, so let's talk now, Sandy, about some security, compliance, and governance considerations. I know, um, you know, in my work with customers, you know, especially our, our bigger customers, this sometimes becomes a bit of a, a hurdle for them to jump through. It's a barrier to them being able to really, you know, roll out, implement, migrate to, et cetera, some of the, the great experiences of Microsoft 365. Um, but we don't want them to be overwhelmed because there's some great capabilities, but at the same time, there's some sort of practical and prescriptive guidance we give them. So would you mind just giving everybody a sort of the latest walkthrough of the Microsoft security uh, capabilities and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, no, thanks Matt, that sounds good. Um, and definitely, so when we think about security and we talk about Microsoft 365, there is a lot within the box. Um, so if to, you know, what I want to do here is kind of just kind of unpack some of the basics around this to make sure everyone's got a clear understanding of, you know, kind of what's within that box uh, from Microsoft 365. And then, then we'll move on to kind of some of the specifics around that, you know, and I think first and foremost behind all of this, as, as Matt said, these things develop and change really dynamically and change uh, kind of very quickly. Um, so we're always keeping, trying to keep one step ahead of any, any of the challenges within the marketplace. And so obviously there's a lot of automation and AI behind all of this to actually make our lives easier and your lives easier. And hopefully Dell's lives, lives easier as well as a key partner of ours uh, from a security and compliance perspective. But if we start at the macro level, um, you know, we start along with kind of the, the top lines there around identity, access, identity and access management. 
Um, we, we look at things in these kind of four buckets from Microsoft three, uh, 365 perspective. Um, you know, we're investing in these four areas and these are the four key pillars that we look at. So it's, you know, identity, access management, information protection, threat protection and cloud security. In the blue box, you can see some of the some of the selections about kind of the actual physical products that kind of sit within that. But to kind of let me distill that down to actually what that really means then. So starting on the left hand side, you know, we do see that the vast majority of breaches uh, begin with compromised passwords. You know, they're probably the single weakest link uh, in most security strategies. So then if we start to think about a really strong identity and access management kind of process and approach, then we can start to think about how to protect your resources. So think about kind of the people side of it as well. And then moving to the right, you know, kind of, you know, many customers tell us that, um, you know, some of the difficulty they have is to holistically and consistently protect and govern their information. You know, uh, a small stat is that, you know, 64% of organizations report that employees have externally shared private or sensitive business information. It's it's easy to do and it's, you know, kind of something that you can not always write a policy for. So there's a lot of education behind here, but also a lot of technology that can start protecting that. So with the share that kind of information outside the business, um, what we can do is start to look at how we can, you know, kind of protect that. So, you know, information protection uh, you know, is a priority for our, pro for our customers. And so we can protect key sensitive data wherever it lives, whether it's, you know, kind of whether it's in storage or whether it's in transit. So we can start to think about actually how we can support you to try and negate some of those kind of, you know, kind of internal risks or uh, external risks to make life easier. Um, and then from a threat perspective, um, often our customers are also, you know, expressing deep concerns about the high volume of data and alerts they're getting. So, you know, attacks these days are getting increasingly sophisticated. And so there's in, those impacts are growing and growing as well. And so by, by prioritizing and integrating uh, the automated threat protection, we can help you meet some of those demands and more importantly, protect, um, you know, protect that, you know, that data that we're going to come across every day in the real world. And so we kind of, you know, again, a package there to support that. Um, and then, and then interesting on the right hand side, you might think this is slightly surprising from a Microsoft perspective, but we like to think around actually kind of multi cloud and kind of cloud security. Um, and so as enterprises move more and more to the cloud, you know, it's been never been more important to protect all of that cloud resource. You know, that could be Azure, it could be AWS, it could be Slack, it could be Salesforce.com. But we've built a comprehensive, you know, cloud security tool set to protect every layer of those clouds. Um, to make sure that you can kind of manage those resources, regardless of the cloud or the cloud apps that you use. But then importantly, underpinning all of that is, you know, security management. So there's a selection of, you know, security management tools to help you kind of, you know, A, manage, but B, you know, guide and create that policy and that central policy to support all of those kind of, to underpin those four pillars that we've just talked about. So that's going to be a kind of some of the some of the kind of the, the high level kind of you know, security from Microsoft 365 at a, at, a, at a macro level, if that makes sense to everyone. Yeah, Sandy, it's great. I mean, and I appreciate you explaining it. The totality of all this is pretty amazing, right? When you think about the, the sort of suite of capabilities that you can bring to bear. I do think that sometimes customers like to see it in action, right? So what are some examples yeah. of, you know, for example, with Teams, what are some of the highest priority, you know, security and compliance decisions that, that you see customers making? Yep, no, great question, Matt, and uh, quite relevant to, for me as well. Being being the team's lead, I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm very happy to always talk about teams. I was going to sneak Power BI in on there, but uh, I figured I'd let you talk about what you like the best. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so as we all know, or hopefully we all know, so Teams is part of uh, Microsoft 365. So some of that security and compliance, uh, kind of those pillars we just talked about, are, are there underpinning everything that we use within uh, 365 and obviously Teams as well. Um, and at, at, a, at a specific level, when you talk about Teams, we can configure and uh, administer that uh, within the Teams admin center. So you've got complete control over what you do uh, from a policy perspective, and you can create multiple policy packages uh, for diff different scenarios or different users or different groups. So it's, it's really kind of quite simple. Um, and that policy package you know, combines you know, the different settings that relate to the typical work process. Um, for the different users or groups. So it's quite, it's, quite, it's quite intelligent and you can add a fair bit of intelligence to think about actually what's required. So, you know, picking on a few examples here, um, you know, on the uh, kind of on the top left, the kind of, you know, the kind of organization wide one. So actually we need to, we need to make sure we can communicate. So actually, so again, via the admin center, um, you can switch on important things like guest access. 
uh, and then decide what policies you apply to those guests. You know, can they create a channel within the team? And obviously, when you think about guests, don't just think about, you know, kind of individuals coming in or, you know, kind of maybe a, a, another customer or something. Think about other guests within your organization. So is it a contractor or a vendor who works within your organization? Do you want to control how much information they have, even though you're working for them on, maybe on a long term contract? Um, or whether that's, you know, they're you know, down to the levels of are they allowed to create a meeting or open a meeting? Or are you going to wait, make everyone wait in the lobby as, as we experience today for this meeting? So you can you can control that type of thing to uh, either control it or you know kind of and change the user experience depending on what you want to achieve. Um, and then from a maybe an apps perspective, you know actually how do you control that? Because you know I often describe Teams as a window pane onto the work environment, and so you might want to surface different apps through that, whether it's a line of business app. But actually, how do you then control that? So are you going to let people find their favorite apps or their content and share it right within Teams? Are you going to control that? Um, or they might want to, you know, kind of enable them to, you know, pin their favorite apps, you know, into Teams at the top of a channel, for example, um, and or then the next layer down, you know, you can let people use bots, chat with bots, um, and or assign tasks. So we do recommend you look at this and look at how you want to control this and or enable complete complete free use. Uh, but maybe a simple one, a simple example would be as on one of Matt's previous slides was um, include some of the basic apps that people use, things like Planner. If you, when you do your initial Teams rollout, you know, include things like this within it, then people can start to experience the kind of, uh, kind of um, the, the power of Teams as that window pane with the different apps coming through it, but you can do it in a controlled way. So you can, you, and you can gradually kind of open these things up. And then on the right hand side, not just about communication, but also kind of meetings and communications. So actually, how do you look at some of the basics within that as well? So again, within security and compliance, are you going to let people do some of the stuff that maybe I take for granted or Matt takes for granted? And we do a lot of this every day when we work together. Things like desktop sharing. You know, are you going to enable people to do that? Are you going to allow people to use whiteboards um, or you know, the shared note screens within Teams? Um, and then you can start to look at the kind of further policies behind the kind of the meeting and messaging of things like, you know, can you record meetings? Um, are you going to allow transcriptions, which I really hope you do, because from an inclusive perspective, really, really powerful tool. Um, and these days, I've actually had a few questions around, actually, are you going to allow people to chat, you know, with IM? It might sound like an odd thing, but particularly in education, uh, we've had quite a few use cases recently where people have wanted to switch chat off. And I've seen use, use cases for this. So, you know, they don't want school kids to be chatting the whole time uh, on IM to their friends because they want to concentrate on the meeting. So actually, you know, so chat's been switched off, but they can still work within the kind of the team meeting in that education environment. So. You know, it might sound foreign to some of us that you might want to disable chat, but in some use cases, actually, it's important. So yeah, so it's like kind of there's a lot of things you can do here at the basics when you start when you start to think about it. But yeah, these are probably the top of mind for me about how to get people going, um, at, from a from a usage perspective, and you can make sure they've got the basics under control from a team's perspective. No, I love it, Sandy, and I love your uh, single pane of glass analogy there. I think you use different words, but I'll <laughs> I'll change your words. Because, I mean, I love the idea of, you know, from a security window pane, standpoint, <laughs> window pane, thank you. Um, you know, just making sure that when people start their first experience in Teams, that they've got, you know, sort of the right apps available to them. And, and you know, again, some of the, the right policies ready to go. So they don't have to think. They can just start collaborating and working. So it's good stuff. All right. So I'd like to shift topics to the end user side of things because we've been talking a bit more about, you know, kind of the IT portion of the show up until now. Um, so, you know, first of all, why should end users care about Microsoft 365? What's in it for them? Uh, you know, and here at Dell, we recommend that our IT colleagues conduct some formal persona research to really help them better understand who their audience is, what they care about. We call that the moments that matter. And you know, ultimately, we want to incorporate these learnings into our Microsoft 365 rollout strategy and our adoption and change management strategy and content. So Sandy, I know that Microsoft recommends a persona-centric approach as well. Yep. And I know you've got a great example of how you've used that at Microsoft in the past. So what's, uh, do you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, no, not a problem. Um, and it's, uh, I do like this one because it's, I know it's quite a colorful chart, but if you, if you dissect it down, I think it really explains the story really nicely around actually and how the fact that, you know, change is personal. Everyone is different, you know, and people will kind of, uh, accept, adopt, learn, change at different rates. 
and it's not just about a kind of you know uh, maybe the role but it's down to that kind of that kind of the persona level which we're trying to kind of uh, kind of obviously we're trying to simplify down because if uh, in, a, in an organization of 5,000 people we can't or a lot obviously a lot larger for Microsoft we can't uh, can't deal with every single persona but we can we can lump those together into quite fairly generic groups quite effectively and so what we did here and it's a kind of aligned to some you know, kind of major change management methodologies that I know that Matt you follow at Dell as well um, and it's a case of actually well let's understand what those personas are and we'll come back to that but actually then kind of look at the kind of the rollout rates and the different rates of people will accept and different and the different rates people will change through the different phase phase of you know maybe rolling something out or a change management change management program so you can see here we've talked about actually the, that communication phase all fairly normal adoption change management methodology or wording here so you know, how you communicate with the people or all the all your users or end employees you know what how, how much time do they need for training and we can define training in different ways then there's a physical rollout plan. Then there's obviously usually kind of some kind of go back, go back motion around coaching, whether that's their line management uh, and thereafter. And then a reminder plan for those that didn't. So if we took a, maybe take a couple of examples here, um, you know, persona C, for example, here, um, that's actually, you know, kind of a real persona for us. And it's actually some of our field sellers. So the communication plan, plan was quite short and sharp. A lot of it was through uh, kind of method, methods that they liked, you know, was it an IM, was it an SMS? You know, we used different communication methods for our, our, different, our different personas. So field sellers had a fairly short communication plan. Um, they then had a fairly, a fairly short training plan because they could, have, they could, you know, they could manage it and they could fit it into around lots of different things. But then interesting here, the rollout plan was quite long. You know, they were obviously, as, as, as I said, field sellers, they're out and about. Uh, hopefully they were out selling to all our end, end customers as well. So they actually kind of the rollout plan was elongated because we had to suit different scenarios and different rollout plans and different timescales because people couldn't do things. We had other priorities, end of quarter numbers, end of year numbers, whatever it was, uh, the rollout plan was, you know, kind of was slightly longer here. Coaching plan, short and sharp, you know, not to kind of put that persona in one box, but generally that when they're told to do something, they generally did it because they're kind of kind of you know, coin driven, numbers driven, whatever it was. That, but that persona just worked for them. So the coaching plan was quite short. But then, you know, the reminder plan was there. Some people did slip through the cracks and we had to go back and go back and go back. On the flip side, um, the, the second example I'd pull out of here was right next to it, persona D. You can see it's really quite short and compressed here. Um, and this one for us was um, a load of our execs um, that weren't in the initial rollout plans. So often we, for us, we used a lot of execs in the initial rollout plans to, you know, kind of share uh, share the messaging and be part of the plan so people could look up and they would drive drive through good behavior. But we had a whole lot of execs that weren't uh, within that kind of first wave. And generally, you know, they were you know, high powered execs. They're very used to dealing with short, sharp instructions and their, their rollout plan or their whole plan end to end was actually quite short and sharp, as you can see here. So it started later um, because they weren't weren't on the initial phases. And then we just got to them and then, you know, kind of rolled them out very quickly and they accept that fairly quickly. So it's kind of just to pick on two examples here around actually kind of, you know, different people do different things. So everyone's different. And we need to kind of uh, adjust our uh, adjust our persona plan around that. And I know that Matt, you've done a lot around this as well, around actually kind of just that the whole persona analysis and managing that change. Um, and, and and I fully agree with you that, you know, it is all about the people and all about making it personal for those employees. Otherwise we'll, we'll slip. So. Well, it's certainly, no, I appreciate it, Sandy. I mean, and this, this visual does help illustrate it in practice. Right. And, and you could see here, you know, the, the number of personas that were chosen and, you know, there was a specific approach that was crafted for each of them. And, and it's kind of the opposite of what we used to see in the early days of, of Microsoft 365, where, you know, our customers would go with more of a workload based model. It's like, OK, everybody's getting exchanged next month. And then after that, they get SharePoint four months later. Right. And then OneDrive and whatever. This is sort of recognizing that if you want to do this in a way that it actually means something to the end user, you need to target your strategy more on them and less about the workload itself. So it, it's good to see. Um, you know, you're quite right here at Dell. We have our own perspective on how to do this, right? So what Sandy just showed um, is an example of, you know, kind of showing the execution plan. But we have something we call the experience centric operating model for Microsoft 365. And essentially what we're saying is every customer needs to invest in, in each of these three areas of our operating model. The goal is to improve the experience that, that your workforce receives at the end of the rainbow. 
um, but to do it in a measured, personalized, targeted, and prioritized manner. So if I had to summarize what we're talking about here, workforce personas is essentially a technique to help teach you who your internal audiences are, the moments that matter for each of them, and essentially what are the Microsoft 365 scenarios to focus on for each persona. So for example, you may have uh, a type of user in your environment that spends all day in meetings every day, eight, eight nine, 10 hours a day of meetings. Well, it might be good to target that persona with, with information on how to conduct smarter meetings using Microsoft 365 and the Teams experience. So that's just a simple example, but that sort of illustrates the point of why you do the persona research is to find out what scenarios mean the most to which audience. Adoption and change management, the industry I think you know, generally understands and, and values the, the purpose behind it. Here at Dell, we do follow Microsoft's uh, recommendation of using the ProSci framework as sort of the underpinning of our, our methodology. But what we found in the last several years is that customers, you know, while they value the structure of ProSci as a sustained change management mechanism, they you know, ultimately just care about what's in it for them. They, they want the content, the communications, the you know, task lists and schedules and you know, cadence that they need to use with their users. In particular, they, they care about things like champions networks, which are really that sustaining effort to stay engaged with, with every line of business and, and keep you know, kind of your pulse of the organization. So with adoption and change management, it's not one size fits all. It, every program is different, kind of depends on you know, where your users are, how mature you are as an organization, how far down the rainbow you are uh, with Microsoft 365 as a platform, um, but we're here to help. The last one is experience measurement, and just very few of our customers are really doing this well today. And, and we think that there's a big opportunity for all of you out there to start incorporating this into your sustained Microsoft 365 operating model. And essentially, this is how you prove that what you're doing is working. How do you prove that you've got people really changing their behavior and working in a new modern way, as opposed to you know, technically using some of these platforms, uh, you know, like OneDrive and, and Teams, et cetera, but they still predominantly throughout their day are sending email attachments and saving stuff to network file shares all the time. So we want to use experience measurement and the Microsoft graph or workplace analytics, but also do some, some unique things. And Dell has some intellectual property and some approaches here around, you know, how do we do, for example, employee sentiment surveys and analysis in an automated way so that we can marry that with what we're seeing in the workplace analytics uh, telemetry from Microsoft to really get that full picture of, of what's going on, what do people like, what are they not like, and where are there some gaps that we need to, to go plug. So that at a very high level is Dell's experience-centric operating model perspective. And again, I think this is something that started to emerge as a best practice in the last couple of years as we've seen um, some of our customers uh, and their efforts to, to support Microsoft 365 in an ongoing way. So just as a quick example, because we do like to show examples here, this is uh, a scrubbed version of, of personal research that we did for a company. And, and in particular, they had a large population of technical engineers. These were kind of loosely defined as software developers. It was some of those um, systems engineering people that were, worked with NIT, technical architects. This also included some business architects that set out in each LLB. Um, and you can see here that our goal in doing the persona research is to really get to the essence of who these people are, what do they care about, what are the key you know, needs that they have from a day, day in the life standpoint. And you can see here that, that for this audience, they were in meetings all the time, they needed the real-time communication and collaboration tools, um, but they didn't feel like they needed much help in understanding the platform itself. They were, they were pretty hands-on. What I thought in particular was really helpful here is the, at the bottom, who do they collaborate with? And predominantly for this audience, it was internal colleagues. So we wanted to focus our adoption and change management scenarios and some of the templates that we would build in the platform on things like working together efficiently or how, showing them how to use co-authoring and the versioning features that, that underpin Teams and, and SharePoint and OneDrive. So hopefully it gives you an, an example of what it means to actually do persona research. And then, you know, what we like to do is to cor correlate that with those scenarios or what we say here at Dell are user journeys for that persona. Um, and there's a, you know, a long list of kind of key scenarios that Microsoft 365 enables from a productivity standpoint. We typically boil those down into, you know, the right 10 to 15 or so scenarios that, that we think a given customer 
should focus on. And then what we do from there is align the top three or four for each persona. And again, so if you're thinking about creating an adoption and change management strategy, what this allows you to do is really hone in and say, okay, when I communicate with an engineering audience, I'm going to emphasize these scenarios and how Microsoft 365 and, and related tools can help them achieve these outcomes. So hopefully that, that makes it real for you a bit here to get a sense of not just the academic, okay, yes, we're, we're going to do personas and understand people, but, but more of the practical, how do we put it into action? Okay, so Sandy, I would love to go a little deeper here and talk about adoption and change management some more. Uh, we know that this is a hot topic in the industry in general and specifically for Microsoft 365. You've kind of already heard that Dell believes strongly in this and we think everybody should do it. Um, but one of the reasons why they should do it is the rapid pace of innovation that's happening with the Microsoft 365 platform. Uh, yes. essentially, essentially, you can't do it once and, and call it done. So would you mind sharing a bit of context on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and the, rate, the the pace of change does add a new dynamic to this because I, I, I wholeheartedly agree uh, an effective and ongoing adoption change management uh, policy and approach is essential uh, in this day and age, you know, not just for Microsoft technologies, but you know, generally te technology all up. Um, and so I wanted to give you a little brief in, in, you know, kind of view into kind of how we see kind of the, the change in technologies happening. So 365, you know, you receive product updates and features as they become available. So we don't wait for a costly update or don't wait for you know, a big targeted release every year or two. Um, and also, so it's, you know, the, the rollout of updates is phased and going ongoing the whole time. That said, you can manage how you receive those updates. Um, so for example, you could sign up for an early release uh, in your organization. So maybe you might get the release uh, kind of updates first or you can designate who gets releases as well, um, and or you could re remain on the default. Why we do that is because this on the screen here we're kind of outlining actually how or what our approach is. So ring zero first of all. So when we're designing and developing a new feature within Microsoft, uh, we test it and validate it within the product team. So there you know there you know there's test and validation and feedback loops and all, everything else that you can imagine within that. And then the next phase of the release is within you know, kind of the 365 team. So that's kind of a slightly broader group. Again, feedback loop, test validation, et cetera. Then. Uh, and then after that, roll it out to the whole of Microsoft. And even within the whole of Microsoft, we have a couple of different, different rings. So for example, I'm on a, a latter ring of deployment, uh, but then I could, I could be on a really early ring of deployment, what we call, to, to use our internal language, we call it the dog food version. I'd rather be called it champagne version, so we could drink our own champagne, not eat our own dog food. But anyway, that's that's me. Um, and then thereafter, then we start to look at actually how can we include people from on the external side of things. So the first first phase of that is then a targeted release, and then Ring Four is just kind of you know is, is standard deployment thereafter. So it's, you know that's how we how we kind of how we build kind of the rollouts um, within Microsoft. Well, I think in particular, Sandy, what we love about that that third ring there is, you know, when we design things like champions networks yeah. for our customers, uh, you kind of said it, but I'll, I'll emphasize that, you know, a lot of times the carrot that we provide in order to get people to participate and be part of that champions network and frankly be active participants of the, of the champions network is we let them be part of ring three, you know, with yeah. that, that carrot saying, Hey, you're going to see some of the latest features as soon as anyone can see them. Right. And be our sort of, eyes and ears and, and what's working and what's worth getting excited about, et cetera. Yeah, there's a couple of things behind that. So not only kind of the eyes and ears and dangling that carrot, but also because they're the great ambassadors as well. So you might also lump the kind of the IT departments into, the, into, that, into that list as well, because they might want to test and validate it internally. But those champions, absolutely, because they'll, they'll see it as a carrot, but also they'll evangelize. So they'll share what's coming down track and get people excited and make that make that rollout plan within your within your end organizations today, uh, kind of you know it's a, a, bit, a bit easier and slicker as well. It's yeah, it's a very powerful tool, and the yeah, great way of seeing new stuff. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, Sandy. If you don't have the numbers in front of you, that's all right. But I mean, just to put some some quantification to this pace of innovation we're talking about. I mean, what are we talking about? A couple of new features a year, thousands of features somewhere in the middle. Uh -huh. What would you say? Between the two, hundreds and hundreds. So when we talk about uh, 365, obviously 365 is a broad portfolio. Um, so in development, uh, so that would be um, kind of things that are uh, we, we'd see internally. At the about, there's about 320 ongoing at the moment. 
um, uh, rolling out about 180. So rolling out would be kind of that ring three kind of area would, would be would be catching that. And then um, you know, the standard ring forward capture, capture all of the other developments. So that's about, that's about 450 at the moment of the, that being rolled out. So that's from 365 all up. Obviously, you know, uh, from a team's perspective, so close to heart to me. So using the same stats around actually kind of in development, about, about 100, about 95 or 100 in there. Presently rolling out, so new features in that ring three, ring three coming out are about 28, 30, and then we're already launched. Uh, so standard in that ring four already launched, kind of uh, nearly 110 new features, uh, just from a team's perspective. So yeah, you know, all you know, so yeah, it's a busy time, busy time. So yeah, and you guys ever take a, a day off? Jeez. Um, <laughs> 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 all right, so just to, to close on that topic a bit, I mean, you know, because of that piece of innovation. Um, you know, we certainly think that, you know, again, adoption and change management should become a, susta uh, a sustained part of every customer's operating model, especially in regards to Microsoft 365. Um, and we kind of think there's a good way to do this in a bad way. And, you know, a lot of us who've been in the IT industry for longer than we care to say uh, would, would say that most IT projects end with some sort of email and a link to training and they call it done. Right, and that just does not cut it anymore, in general, or certainly not doesn't cut it with Microsoft 365. So some of the things that you see here on the screen, above and beyond communications and training, become really essential because of that pace of innovation. You know, when new features hit uh, the platform. You know, when we had, for example, um, you know, some of the things that are in preview mode or the transcription stuff that's in Teams. You know, that that's only recently become you know, available. And if your users uh, weren't aware of it, you didn't have a champions network to go promote it and get people excited about it and get their feedback on how to communicate it and, and essentially get people's attention, then IT would struggle to get, to get anybody to do anything because you'd just be sending emails yet again that, that could get ignored. Um, I saw stats from one of our customers that, you know, on average, less than 10% of emails sent by IT are, are, are viewed. And, you know, less than 20% of those that view actually click one of the links in the email. So it gives you a sense. That was just one customer, but that's how bad it could get. get. And so we really want to promote some of these other things. Uh, you know, again, whether it's measurement, um, some active sponsorship and coaching, or whether it's this robust champions network, which certainly here at Dell is one of the things that's made our, our rollout uh, as good as it can be. All right, so Sandy, we're going to go to uh, one more section here focused on teams more specifically, which I know you love to talk about. Um, in particular, it's just some best practices around the horn here. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about is actually a little bit of an extension to the adoption and change management conversation, which is just recognizing the fact that Microsoft does make available a lot of materials. So I thought you'd maybe just spend a minute on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Um, and we do this for a variety of reasons. We want to make life as easy as possible and as quick as possible and for people to get the best value from you know, their investment in Microsoft, which we really appreciate. Um, and so on screen, you'll see a simple example of a, of a quick start guide. Um, but we've uh, just launched a new uh, website, actually kind of gathering all of these things together. I'll, uh, I'll happily say that you know, kind of, uh, a few months ago, we had a, a, a lot of information in a lot of different places and we've consolidated it down now. So, um, and the, the link to that, and I'll pop it in the window in a minute, is uh, adoption.microsoft.com. And that is the kind of a single, single front page now for all things adoption. So what we build in there is everything you can imagine, whether it's a quick start guide that you can see here on, on the screen, um, or you know, a flyer they might want to use and promote kind of the storyline internally. So everything you can imagine from kind of from A to Z or A to Z if you're in Europe like me, um, from an adoption perspective, you know, we've pretty much got some good collateral here to get you going. It's important for us to actually you know, get you there with uh, the right you know, documentation, the right information, which is all free to use, free to you to take, uh, and also then interpret your own way, not interpret and change it completely, but interpret as in kind of mold it to the requirements of your people in your organization, because as we said, people and organizations are different. So yes, we've, we have a, a, a ton of material um, and it's you know kind of it, enough to do everything you can imagine from day one and uh, from to get the basics under control. But I would thoroughly recommend then coming back to actually get a more structured approach, which is then you know kind of back to what we're talking about here from a, from a Dell perspective. 
No, that's great, Sandy. And, and we, we certainly use every ounce of that content that Microsoft makes available. And, and what we find, honestly, in a lot of cases, it's good enough. In some cases, customers want to tweak it, tailor it, yeah. put their own spin on it, as you said, right? Maybe there are some features that they've decided to turn off, for example, that are touted in some of the Microsoft materials. And so we might need to do some creative edits of those materials to you know, kind of hide those things and, and you know, essentially avoid the situation where we communicate something and then it's not actually available in the, in the platform to them. Um, but some of the things you see here are just examples of other types of adoption change management work that Dell has ended up doing for customers. You know, again, under the banner of, of filling that gap between uh, the, ba the great basics that Microsoft provides to all of us on adoption.microsoft.com, but also, uh, you know, the reality and recognition that every customer is different. Um, I will say that, you know, one of the things that's on here is Dell Education Services has a role-based and persona-based uh, training portal that we make available to customers. The content is kept, kept you know, up to date. You can create these persona-based or role-based learning paths and then kind of cross-promote it within the M365 platform. A great kind of uh, easy way to, to add formal training to your overall ACM program. But some of the other things you see here are examples of, of where our services teams have gone and, again, done some custom work to, to help a particular customer. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about Teams business apps um, because, you know, a lot of our customers um, start this journey with M365. They get Teams out there for some of the basic meeting and collaboration use cases. Um, and again, some, some customers stop there and they leave it to the business to do whatever they want at that point. And some are, you know, taking more centralized control of it from an IT perspective. You know, ultimately, you know, we think, the best team's experience is one that is tailored to the scenarios and business processes and business apps that a given group of users is using. So if you've got a group of developers using Teams as their core collaboration tool, well, you might want to make sure that you've integrated the GitHub app and <coughs> you know any other DevOps tool chain tools that they're using and bring that into that Teams window pane. Did you say Sandy? <laughs> window pane or cockpit <laughs> is probably what I would have said. Um, to, to make that experience as immersive and integrated as it can be. Um, it might also doing, be doing basic things. So there are ways to create templates within the Teams experience so that, for example, if your marketing uh, group wants to use Teams in a repeated way to run their each of their marketing events throughout the year, well, why don't we create a tailored template for them that has the right tabs set up, the right apps installed and integrated, the right layouts, uh, in widgets, et cetera, so that next time they, they go to collaborate on a new event, they can spin up a team for the people participating and, and they're, they're already on their way. So those are just some of the examples of how, you know, Dell is helping customers go through this journey with, you know, Teams business apps. There's a lot to talk about here, um, but I'm going to show you one example. So the scenario I just described with, you know, marketing wanting to, you um, you know, have a template that meets their unique needs. Well, we could do that purely through custom code and, you know, essentially just, just do it as a one-off. But if we think that that's going to be something that we want to do for lots of different audiences within our organization, and that you might end up with 5, 10, 15, or more templates in your environment, we really love working with our ISV partner called BindTuning to, to really help customers mature that practice of taking some starter kit materials, like the ones you see here, listening to and doing the persona research for your users to understand how they work and what they want to see in that default template. Um, and then, you know, taking some value added widgets that bind tuning provides to do things like data lookups and RSS integration. Um, you can see some of the other ones here on the screen. Again, through the lens of the persona that, that we are talking about. And then ultimately, they have a provisioning engine that allows us to take that template, package it up, deploy it into the tenant, and then essentially for the users that we allow, let them create new teams using that template. And it's such a powerful way to get you know, more personalized experiences into the hands of, of our users, and we couldn't, couldn't love it enough. So I just wanted to show that as, as one real practical example of, of this stuff coming together. All right, one last thing on, on Microsoft Teams, and, and that is um, the reality that a lot of meetings this year and the years to come are going to become hybrid meetings, meaning that 
you know, as, as more and more companies have workers working in geographically distributed areas, more and more workers, you know, working from home or remotely, those physical meeting rooms are going to need to adapt and they need to support the idea of a hybrid meeting. And so this is an area that Dell is, is getting into the business of uh, to essentially develop and deploy uh, end-to-end solutions to, to run those new modern rooms uh, using Microsoft Teams rooms capability. We're really excited about this and are launching services to correspond to uh, help customers get these new modern rooms designed and implemented and managed in their environment. Uh, but as all of you think about you know, how your physical workplace may change over time. We certainly think that this type of model, this hybrid meeting room that supports remote attendees uh, in a fir first class way is, is really a great thing to aspire to. All right, so we're nearing the end here. I uh, just wanna say that, uh, you know, we, we are as a getting started, uh, you know, certainly helping customers with the, uh, the, the Microsoft prescribed uh, secure remote workshop and other flavors such as calling in meetings. So if that's the way that you'd like to engage, uh, certainly happy to. Uh, there's also um, some additional types of you know, assessments and advisory engagements that Dell Technology Services can do for you. Um, here are some, some links to some, you know, where you can get more information from us. So I highly encourage you uh, this is the first day of our launch of our, our services uh, virtual headquarters platform. I highly encourage you to check out all the other experiences and content that's available in that virtual headquarters. It's it's pretty engaging and and frankly just fun to to go you know click around and see what content is there. We've done our best to give you a great interactive experience there. And then on the right hand side are just some examples of some of our content and perspectives, including you know things like a white paper, or ebook type of uh, document. So I want to, first of all, thank you so much, Sandy, for my uh, partner here in delivering the session today. It's always a pleasure to present with you. Likewise, sir. Always a pleasure. Thank you again for the invite. Yeah, and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you on our next session. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.